तगवतो अर्हतो सबुद्ध नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो सबुद्ध नमो सस् भगवतो अर्हतो सबुद्ध so today we have a guest uh, rajin dinesh and uh, we call uh, him acharya because it is a uh, indian name for teacher so acharya uh, rajin dinesh uh, so uh, he has uh, done a lot of online courses he has also uh, shadowed uh, bante vimadram ji in his uh, retreats and uh, he has extensive knowledge and uh, of teaching students online and he has also uh, visited us on a sunday uh, 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 talks so he has a, a vast knowledge and we want to share um, as much as possible from different point of views and uh, we will also be uh, putting this on uh, youtube so a larger audience kind of uh, can appreciate and know uh, about uh, the teachers and he will be kind of uh, trying to put in more time from january uh in the, on teaching so we may kind of have physical retreats for him uh in india uh then uh, we can uh have him more interact with us uh, as uh, the time goes so i will give the floor to rajiv uh, because he will be talking about uh, brahma viharas and the sutras uh, which we have mentioned just now which would be uh, maha rahul avada sutta and uh, metta sahagatena Sutta uh, will be a part of this uh, this course. So uh, I would uh, give the floor to Rajiv. Thank you, Bante. Thank you. I'd like uh, all of you to just think of me as a friend in the Dhamma. Uh, I've spent some time. I've had the fortune of uh, getting a lot of direct instruction from Bante Vimala Ramsey, and uh, I've had the beautiful gift of Dhamma in my life, and uh, it's. been quite uh, life transforming and it's my privilege to be able to share some of that and uh, hope that you can enjoy the same kind of fruits of this life uh, so today i just wanted to spend a little time uh, talking about the brahma viharas as uh, those of you who are uh, who have been practicing who have done either uh, retreats or who have been uh, training themselves based on the books uh, by bante or uh, you know the youtube talks etc so uh, you would be familiar that uh, unlike most of the popular meditation uh, that is uh, known around the world today we use the brahma viharas or the four divine abodes as a object of uh, meditation so i want to talk a little bit about the brahma viharas and uh, also how they connect with the jhana practice the practice of going into deep collected states where we can observe the movement of our mind with greater level of clarity and also gain insights into the working of our mind into the generation of our experiences and eventually into the generation of suffering the origin of suffering and the cessation of suffering itself right so that is the uh, topic i want to talk about uh, before that uh, i'd like to just uh, you know as a group if we can uh, spend at least a minute uh, just collectively sending metta to sister kema she's going through a very tough time right now and uh, going through she's uh, getting very intensive uh, pain medication as well so since the topic is brahma viharas i think it is apt that we start by practicing it and uh, uh, you know spend 1 uh, to 2 minutes just sending metta to sister kema and then we'll ta- start the rest of the discussion
right then so we can start i would request uh, that we send the wishes whenever we get the opportunity during the day okay so uh, just coming back to the topic of the brahma vihara so what are the four divine abodes so these are four states of mind that the buddha describes as being uh, worthy of being a home for the gods uh, divine abode so what are these what we start the meditation with the practice with the first uh, of the brahma viharas which is metta or uh, known as maitri in uh, hindi and uh, translated in english as loving kindness so this is a feeling of goodwill towards another the second is uh, karuna or compassion so this is a slightly more evolved state of understanding where uh, not only do we direct goodwill towards others but uh, we have started as we uh, deepen our practice as we start understanding the activities of our mind we start to understand how suffering originates in us in different circumstances as we do that as we become more familiar with that we also become a lot more sensitive and aware of the fact that other people go through the same kind of phenomena they experience suffering in their lives they create suffering in their lives for themselves they experience suffering on account of the actions of others so as this understanding deepens we are also able to see that suffering and we are able to love people more uh, because of that so that uh, evolution represents the transition to karuna or compassion from there the third brahma vihara is of unqualified or altruistic joy this is uh, even uh, harder to develop it's uh, still there are like there are a lot of instincts in us which say that if somebody is suffering you know if somebody is suffering for example visibly we do feel a sense of kindness we do understand that they may be having a tough time even if somebody is not visibly suffering visibly agonized the development of compassion within us allows us to understand that you know it's better for us to make things easy for them it's better to be kind towards them it is better to work towards making their lives better but when it comes to mudita or uh, unconditional unqualified altruistic appreciative joy so there we are talking about the next stage of evolution where even when we see somebody else succeed something good happens in their lives we feel a sense of happiness so as a uh, you know pack animal almost you know that we have evolved from so we have been living in groups so the natural tendency for humans is to derive their self worth by comparison with other members of the group right and uh, a lot of us may have experienced at some point in life that when we see someone else succeed the immediate reaction may be why couldn't such good fortune have happened with my me right why couldn't i have gotten that or the other person may have gotten that because of some kind of unfair advantage so these kind of petty thoughts often come in our mind so the next stage of evolution is where you are able to see some and this is also kind of a deepening of compassion you see suffering in yourself you see suffering in other people and when you see an opportunity for that suffering to be alleviated for them you feel joy in that you feel uh, good about that so that is mudita it's a unqualified appreciative all pervading sense of joy and the fourth brahma vihara is uh, the hardest to achieve which is equanimity or upekha it's uh, translated in hindi as samata why is equanimity hard equanimity is hard because uh, it gets affected by the very underlying process of craving or tanha or trishna what craving does is in any situation we get any kind of information from our surroundings any kind of information from our thoughts from our internal environment our first reaction our natural reaction is to start by classifying it as something that we like or we don't like and therefore we want it we don't want it we become 
tied to a certain kind of outcome. We say that a certain outcome in this circumstance will give us pleasure. We want that. If we don't get it, we will be unhappy. And if we get it, then we'll be afraid of losing that kind of uh, satisfaction, that kind of outcome. Right? So that's what uh, uh, happens. And equanimity is the highest of the Brahma Viharas or the divine abodes because equanimity says gives us the ability to experience life, to experience events and to see them for what they are instead of being repulsed or overly attracted to them. Instead of uh, thinking it happened to me or why is this happening to me? I like it. I don't like it. Instead of going through these kind of thought processes, we acknowledge that it happened and we try to identify what is the appropriate action that we can take in that situation. If there is no action to be taken, then we let it be. We do not get uh, agitated and uh, chase after that. So these are the four Brahma Viharas in increasing order of uh, complexity, in increasing order of uh, deepening understanding of uh, mental processes of the Dhamma, right? So let me start with a small excerpt from the Maha Rahulovad Sutra. This is a teaching that the Buddha gave to his uh, own son Rahul and uh, it's part of a fairly long discourse but I'll just touch upon the part where the Buddha talks about the Dhamma Viharas. So the Buddha says, uh, Rahula, meditate on loving kindness. For when you meditate on loving kindness, any ill will will be given up. Meditate on compassion. For when you meditate on compassion, any cruelty will be given up. Meditate on rejoicing, on appreciative joy. For when you meditate on appreciative joy, any discontent will be given up. Finally, he says, Rahula, meditate on equanimity. For when you meditate on equanimity, any aversion will be given up. So what the Buddha says here is that uh, the four divine abodes, the Brahma Viharas, they are antidotes to a lot of undesirable experiences, qualities or tendencies in our life. These are the same qualities, tendencies that cause us to indulge in unwholesome actions and create and those actions could be physical, those actions could be mental, those actions could be actions of speech. And when we partake in those actions, we create suffering for ourselves in the present, we create suffering for other people and we create suffering for ourselves in the future. I'm just uh, repeating quickly. Loving kindness is an antidote to ill will. Compassion is an antidote to cruelty. Appreciative joy is an antidote to discontent. And equanimity is an antidote to aversion. So if you think about it, when we uh, practice loving kindness, when we practice the giving of goodwill to another person, another creature. So any thoughts of ill will, of not having their best interests in our mind are almost diametrically opposite and they get slowly diffused, slowly dissolved in our mind. As the Buddha says in other suttas, whatever the mind spends time on, that becomes the inclination of the mind. Whatever the mind ponders on, whatever the mind thinks on, whatever the mind processes, it becomes the inclination of the mind. So what the Buddha talks about is how every action that we do, every action that we take, reinforces certain behaviors in us. So our mind simply understands internally. So I'm not talking about an intellectual level where we are reasoning things out, where we are trying to understand the logic of something, but at a much deeper level. So when we form habits, when someone says something, we have a certain reaction. Only a part of it is actually dictated by logic. Most of it is dictated by 
habitual tendencies that we have gathered so when we meditate on loving kindness when we practice loving kindness we are teaching our mind new wholesome habits and these habits are directly in contrast to habits of ill will that we may have developed over the course of our lives and as we teach the mind that this is a good way to develop our mind develop our thinking develop our attitude it starts cementing this kind of habit starts cementing same thing happens with compassion any thoughts of cruelty for instance require you to suspend any understanding of the suffering that another person will have or have any compassion towards it you know that they will suffer and you do not care about it that is the ingredient of doing a cruel action as we work on compassion and it is uh, perfectly normal perfectly natural for the untrained mind to uh, indulge in cruel activities without even understanding it without even intending that cruelty it is because of the under development of compassion but as we meditate on compassion as we use compassion as we share it with other living beings we start changing that behavior we start training our mind on how to interpret different circumstances how to think about making decisions about actions whether it is at the logical level whether it is at the level of the habits that we create for ourselves so when we meditate on compassion any cruelty will be given meditate on appreciative joy appreciative joy is an antidote to discontent if we think about it most of our discontent comes from comparison so maybe 50 30 years back if i had a cell phone no matter what cell phone if it it is maybe it is the size of a brick maybe it is the size of a radio right i would feel top of the world because i'm the only one who has it and today if i don't have an iphone i might feel uh, a little discontent whatever i had an iphone maybe a hundred years back if i had a very nice uh, horse carriage i would have been extremely happy but now i want a longer faster better bigger car than the next person so discontent again comes from comparison it comes from trying to put ourselves in a certain ranking in the social hierarchy while it is good to do work do honest work and uh, be able to improve our ability to provide a comfortable life to ourselves to our family however having discontent is only something that will create a lot of suffering for us and it will train us to create to perform actions that will create suffering for others as well so appreciative joy acts as or mudita acts as a antidote to discontent and finally with equanimity this uh, is fairly straightforward any aversion will be given so aversion to a lot of familiar aversions that we have is to different political ideologies or different uh, behavioral patterns of people around us people in our families people at our workplace Uh, we have that aversion we don't like it we immediately have a visceral almost physical reaction to those things but when we have equanimity when we develop equanimity we identify that a certain event has occurred most of the times that event doesn't require us to respond doesn't require us to do something we can go about our way or if there is an action to be taken we can think of the most appropriate action that we can take if it is something political for instance you know that you have power with your vote and the elections will come around if you are in a certain type of profession for example you may choose to work on petitioning the government or you know work on uh, organizing uh, information for a particular uh, for presenting a particular point of view those are actions that can be taken but the repulsion the repulsion itself the aversion that is something that is optional that is something that causes a lot of heartburn internationally social media ends up uh, 
creating a lot of extremely polarized eco chambers and that spills over to multiple facets related to culture for instance this is just one example aversion can have many 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 flavors so when we meditate on equanimity when we develop equanimity when we inculcate it within us we move past habits of immediately personally identifying with certain events and obsessing over our like or dislike of it what we do instead is understand that the event has ha happened and consider within ourselves what is the most appropriate most compassionate most equanimous and most considerate action most wholesome action that we can take so this is uh, the buddha instructing rahula on the four brahma viharas and what they are an antidote i'll now move to a very very interesting sutta and this is from the samyutta nikaya metta sahagat sutra this is uh, translated as full of love i'm using the translation by bhikkhu sujato over here so the, i'll give a very brief uh, background for the sutta and then we'll go through it and we'll also have some discussions uh, during the sutta and at the end we can have some q and a so what what we talked about a little earlier we talked about the brahma viharas we talked about it as being antidotes to certain unwholesome qualities often it can be mistaken to be generic popular or social wisdom right think positive develop positive feeling discard negative feelings everybody says that every uh, you know it, it is also at some level it is intuitive nobody not doesn't want to do it but uh, it's a different matter whether we end up successfully developing them or not but what is special about the brahma viharas as taught by the buddha so that is the kind of central point of it the other of this sutta the other part is uh, in the madhyama nikaya there are around 150 uh, suttas and uh, in almost 50 of them the buddha describes the paths to cultivation of mind and abandonment of suffering as going through the jhanas the dhyan samadhis or collected deep collected states of observation of understanding of developing insight developing mindfulness developing right effort so he talks about them as the as a path towards the abandonment of suffering to the a path towards the acquisition of happiness path towards the acquisition of wisdom again uh, how the brahma viharas actually combine with the jhanas right with the dhyan samadhis with those states of collectedness to help us to develop very specific very granular understanding of our minds processes a very deep insight into the human condition so to speak so that is what the buddha discovered and that is how it is different from the kind of popular wisdom that i was talking about that hey think positive focus on good positive qualities does that necessarily does knowledge of that or does even believing in that to some extent practicing in practicing those qualities does that really lead to mental transformation growth or do they need to be used in a specific context and with some technique and skill so that is uh, discussed in this sutta so i'll go through this i'll pause at a few points to just uh, elaborate a little bit and uh, we can have questions at the end of the sutta samyutta nikaya 46.54 full of love metta sahagat sut At one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Kolians where they have a town called Halidavasana. Then several mendicants robed up in the morning and taking their bowls and robes entered Halidavasana for alms. It occurred to them it's too early to wander for alms in Halidavasana why don't we go to the monastery of the wanderers who follow other paths. 
then they went to the monastery of the wanderers who follow other paths and exchange greetings with the wanderers there when the greetings and polite conversation were over they sat down to one side the wanderers said to them so the other uh, seekers that these uh, bhikkhus or these uh, mendicants went to uh, they said a reverence the ascetic gotama teaches his disciples like this come mendicants give up these five hindrances what are the hindrances greed aversion restlessness laziness or sloth and torpor as it is often translated and doubt so most of the things that come and make us uh, that attract our thought and uh, that we end up personalizing that we end up identifying with they come in these broad five flavors so either they are related to something that we want which is greed some outcomes that we want or some things that we don't want that we dislike and that is aversion it can be restlessness because the mind is continuously scanning for information it is in today's day and age of the mobile phones we are even addicted to this kind of continuous seeking of information so restlessness it comes from a very evolutionary uh, origin which is uh, the fact that when we lived in the forest we needed to continuously scan the environment to look for threats so it comes from that but uh, it is uh, something it is forms a particular flavor it may not have too much to do with liking or disliking particular thoughts or particular trains of thoughts but it is simply to do with our uh, restlessness uh, unsettled mind then we have sloth and torpor or laziness which is uh, a hindrance where essentially our awareness our mindfulness our alertness gets dulled so it is a kind of counterpart to restlessness with a lot of restlessness not getting any very meaningful information the mind starts to become dull it starts to become constricted it starts to become uh, st- starts losing its alertness right? so that is the fourth hindrance and the fifth hindrance is that of doubt so doubt can take various forms if you are doing the practice doubt can be about whether you are doing it correctly doubt can be it's a very uh, extremely effective rabbit hole of uh, getting lost in people have doubts about their potential people have uh keep questioning themselves am i doing the right thing in life people have doubts about their relations people have doubts about uh, and those could be personal relations those could be work relations there are a lot of doubts so there is a lack of uh, uh confidence and lack of comfort with the fact that we will not always have very clear evidence that allows us to judge a situation in one way or the other so discomfort with that uncertainty and discomfort with even where there is enough information to be fairly certain doubt can become a tendency it can become a habit reverence the ascetic gotama teaches his disciples like this come mendicants give up these five hindrances corruptions of the heart that weaken wisdom and meditate spreading a heart full of love to one direction and to the second and to the third and to the fourth in the same way above below across everywhere all around spread a heart full of loving kindness to the whole world abundant expansive limitless free of enmity and ill will so for those of you who have been doing the uh, advanced practice instruction so these are the practice instructions that you start uh, using once you uh, have experienced the fourth jhana onwards so we start the practice by sending loving kindness to ourselves fill our selfish tummy a little bit then we share that to a person that we find broadly unreproachable somebody that we very naturally have a feeling of goodwill for we send that to one good friend spiritual friend and as uh, our mind starts to deepen with that feeling we expand our circle of sending loving kindness by working with family members working with neutral people working with people that may be difficult to deal with and finally as our mind uh, understands this as our understanding of loving kindness comfort with loving kindness comfort with understanding our mind develops we start 
this practice where we are sending loving kindness to all beings in every direction so the buddha's essentially outlined the words of the buddha that the other wanderers are using is outlining that practice moving on to the other practices of ours meditate spreading a heart full of compassion the second brahma vihara to one direction and to the second and to the third and to the fourth in the same way above below across everywhere all around spread a heart full of compassion to the whole world abundant expansive limitless free of enmity and ill will then on to the third meditate spreading a heart full of rejoicing to one direction and to the second and to the third and to the fourth in the same way above below across everywhere all around spread a heart full of appreciative joy to the whole world abundant expansive limitless free of enmity and ill will meditate spreading a heart full of equanimity to one direction and to the second you get the idea so the wanderers say this is what uh, gautama the buddha teaches we too teach our disciples in just the same way what then is the difference between the ascetic gautama's teaching and instruction and ours so they are asking the question like right? think positive don't think negative this is what we say as well so what is special about the gautama's teaching those mendicants neither approve nor dismiss that statement of the wanderers who follow other paths they got up from their seat thinking we will learn the meaning of this statement from the buddha himself so they have they are still learning they have not had this insight for themselves and uh, they have been following instructions from the buddha they have been having great results but they have never questioned in this way so they were unable to answer those wanderers so then after the meal when they returned from the arms round they went up to the buddha bowed sat down to one side and told him what happened so the buddha responds mendicants when wanderers who follow other paths say this you should say to them but reverence how is the heart's release or mind's release by love developed what is its destination apex fruit and end how is the mind's release by compassion developed what is its destination apex fruit and end so the translation used by bikku sujato is uh, heart here uh, but the word the pali word is used is chitta which can also be thought of as the mind or some people like to call it the mind heart so i will use that interchangeably what we are talking about is the entirety of our faculties of thought and uh, faculties of understanding uh, mental processes how is the heart released by appreciative joy developed what is its destination apex fruit and end how is the heart released by equanimity developed what is its destination apex fruit and end question like this the wanderers who follow other paths would be stumped and in addition would get frustrated why is that because they are out of their element i don't see anyone in this world with its gods maras and brahmas this population with its ascetics and brahmins its gods and humans who could provide a satisfying answer to these questions except for the realized one or his disciple or someone who has heard it from them so essentially the buddha is saying that uh, unless it is used in a specific technique there is a difference between saying think positive and using these very skillfully to actually achieve the heart or the mind's release and how is the heart's release by loving kindness developed what is its destination apex fruit and end it's when a mendicant develops the heart's release by love together with the awakening factors of mindfulness investigation of principles energy rapture tranquility collectedness and equanimity which rely on seclusion fading away and cessation and ripeness letting go so the buddha is describing the process of going into jhana states of deep collection so as we sit down in our meditation work with an object of meditation our mind gets distracted on different thoughts different things that are happening in the environment sounds memories 
thoughts of the future so those things come and take our attention away when we understand this we use the faculty of mindfulness to recognize that our mind has our attention has distracted it has wandered away on understanding this on recognizing this we use right effort or wise effort which is samma vyayam in uh, pali samyak vyayam in uh, hindi we let that thought be we don't personalize it we don't go chasing after it we don't get repulsed by it we let it be we relax the tension and tightness that is the underlying craving that is binding our attention to that thought we relax that we smile again get our mind to a uplifted state and come back to the object of meditation as we do this our mind goes deeper into collected states which is the jhana which are the jhana and during the jhanas we need to balance these different factors so the enlightenment factors or the awakening factors mindfulness is the central factor because that tells us it's uh, derives its uh, root from the word for memory sati or smriti in sanskrit right? and what are we being asked to remember we are being instructed to remember where our attention is and how it is moving from one thing to another so with mindfulness as the principal awakening factor we bring in other things that help us to actually understand things so on one side we have things that uh, help us to be alert to different phenomena that are happening in the mind so this these are the awakening factors like the awakening factor of investigation a curiosity to learn how our minds processes work energy or resolve that uh, there is a resolve to stick with the object of meditation there is a resolve to come back and not give up not get frustrated by the fact that the mind is getting distracted again and again that's that energy or resolve then there is joy or rapture priti that is or pity is the pali word that it's a, it may sound like a flippant way of saying it that makes it fun learning is always easier when it is fun so that happiness almost puts us in the same mode as when we are playing a video game we don't lose we don't get distraught we just keep playing till we get better and we learn more so these help in bringing alertness and uh, curiosity inquisitiveness resolve you know persistence into our practice and the other side we have tranquility or the relaxed step that we use for instance that reduces the noise that uh, reduces the craving that we have with different phenomena happening in our mind we have collectedness which is settling into the dhana where we stop dividing our field of awareness into a subject and an object we stop personalizing things we start allowing things to manifest to go without worrying about them we don't try to fight with any thoughts any information that is coming into our field of awareness we just stay collected calmly comfortably with the object of meditation and finally we have equanimity so equanimity helps us again not get repulsed or unduly attracted to different things that are happening in our meditation in our mind during the meditation so on one hand we are creating a calmness so think about it as if you're reading a book if you're sitting in a moving vehicle it's going to be very hard and if you're not alert to it you're not going to be able to if you don't have any inclination interest uh, you will not going to be able to absorb much from that book so on one hand we use the factors of tranquility collectedness and equanimity to smooth down the state in which we are trying to understand trying to receive new information and on the other hand we are bringing in a little bit of purpose curiosity joy into that process of understanding things so these work together to 
help us uh, understand more about mental processes. It's when a mendicant develops the heart's release by loving kindness together with the awakening factors of mindfulness, investigation, energy, rapture, tranquility, collectedness, and equanimity, which rely on seclusion, fading away, and cessation, and ripen as letting go. If they wish, may I meditate perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive, that's what they do. If they wish, may I meditate perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive, that's what they do. If they wish, may I meditate perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive and the repulsive, that's what they do. If they wish, may I meditate perceiving the unrepulsive in the repulsive and the unrepulsive, that's what they do. Don't worry, I'll be, uh, I may sound like I'm rapping, but uh, I will uh, just uh, explain this part. Uh, it's not very important to go very line by line at this point. It's, you can always do a deeper study on the sutta but uh, we can discuss and the final part which is a little more important if they wish may i meditate staying equanimous mindful and aware rejecting both the repulsive and the unrepulsive that's what they do the apex of the heart's release by loving kindness is the beautiful the word again translation used by sujato bhikkhu sujato is beautiful it can be auspicious it can be wholesome uh, the word uh, the root word pali word can be translated that the apex of the heart or mind's release by loving kindness is wholesome, auspicious, beautiful. I say, for a mendicant who has not penetrated to a higher freedom. So when we talk about meditate perceiving the repulsive in the unrepulsive, unrepulsive in the repulsive, etc. So what are we talking about? Uh, we are talking about the ability of the mind to see how we are personally attaching and personally bringing in on the basis of craving, on the foundation of craving, we are bringing in a flavor of like or dislike to a certain phenomena that's happening in our mind. And we can see that it could as well be otherwise. We are able to see that this is an act of craving. We are able to see also that without craving, it can be treated just as an event that has happened, which is what the last part says, may I meditate, staying equanimous, mindful and aware, rejecting both the repulsive and the unrepulsive. I just let them be. I do not chase after the qualities of repuls repulsiveness or unrepulsiveness. I am also able to see what is considered unrepulsive normally could very well be considered the other way. We are able to see things as they are and we are able to see that these qualities that we assume belong to those phenomena, belong to the information coming to us, belong to those certain thoughts are actually things that we are layering on top of that. So we are able to see this in granularity. So this was about loving kindness and the next parts become even more interesting because there are specific jhanas. So for those of you who've progressed to these different uh, levels, Bhante teaches uh, after the fourth jhana, the texture of the feeling that you're radiating, the loving kindness automatically changes as you enter the fifth jhana. It becomes karuna or compassion. As we move to the sixth, it becomes mudita or appreciative joy. And as we move to the seventh jhana, it becomes equanimity or upekha. Right? So it automatically, it as our understanding, as our the depth of our mind and understanding grows, that feeling changes. And as we develop those feelings, develop our familiarity with generating those feelings, we can also generate them in daily life as and when applicable. Coming back, how is the heart's mind heart's release by compassion developed? What is its destination, apex, fruit, and end? I will paraphrase a part of it. Uh, it's when a mendicant develops the heart's release by compassion together with the awakening factors. Buddha talks about all the awakening factors. And uh, then he talks about may I meditate perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive and so on. May I meditate staying equanimous, mindful and aware, rejecting both the repulsive and the unrepulsive. 
if they wish that's what they do or else going totally beyond perceptions of form so the gross perceptions of form gross sensation of the body so as we enter the arupa jhanas we start losing the gross sensation of the body and uh, we are moving more in a kind of mental realm or else going totally beyond perceptions of form with the ending of perceptions of impingement not focusing on perceptions of diversity aware that space is infinite they enter and remain in the dimension of infinite space the apex of the hearts released by compassion is the dimension of infinite space i say for a mendicant who has not penetrated to a higher freedom so the buddha is describing how compassion development of compassion takes us to infinite space i am not going to dwell too much on you know, so we have talked about perceptions of form we have talked about ending of perceptions of impingement not focusing on perceptions of diversity i'm not going too much into these points uh, otherwise we'll be take a very long uh, time indeed but essentially what uh, the buddha is saying is uh, without creating any subject object divides in our mind being collected as we become more collected along with the feeling of compassion as we are able to see things without craving without running after them without getting attracted or repulsed by them we move into the realm of the base of infinite space and how is the heart released by appreciative joy developed what is its destination apex fruit and it's when a mendicant develops the heart's release by appreciative joy together with the awakening factors if they wish they may i meditate perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive that's what they do if they wish may i meditate staying equanimous mindful and aware rejecting both the repulsive and the unrepulsive that's what they do or else going totally beyond the dimension of infinite space aware that consciousness is infinite they enter and remain in the dim- dimension of infinite consciousness the apex of the heart released by appreciative joy is the dimension of infinite consciousness i say for a mendicant who has not penetrated to a higher freedom so infinite space infinite uh, consciousness is the sixth jhana and what happens as we get to this uh, jhana as we are send joy to all living beings across the world we start seeing different contacts that are happening on our person so if it is a sound whether it is light hitting our eyes whether it is a thought we start seeing more of those contacts happen and the consciousness is in action so if you are to hear a sound you will be able to actually differentiate the many different incidents of those sounds hitting your eardrums for instance so you start seeing consciousness or if you have a thought coming up you see you know, a very primal thought and then layers of it getting added on it so all the consciousnesses that are getting triggered as a result of contact you start seeing them very minutely so this is the realm of infinite consciousness and how is the heart released by equanimity developed what is its destination apex fruit and end it's when a mendicant develops the heart released by equanimity together with the awakening factors if they wish may i meditate perceiving the repulsive and the unrepulsive that's what they do if they wish may i meditate staying equanimous mindful and aware rejecting both the repulsive and the unrepulsive that's what they do or else going totally beyond the dimension of infinite consciousness aware that there is nothing at all they enter and remain in the dimension of nothingness the apex of the heart released by equanimity is the dimension of nothingness this is the seventh jhana i say for a mendicant who has not penetrated to a higher freedom so what happens is as we get more and more equanimous we start radiating equanimity
what starts happening is uh, we also start uh, moving towards a quiet mind. We start moving towards the dimension of nothingness. We, instead of different thoughts that are formed, different thoughts that we start giving names to, start giving a lot of concepts to, we start seeing the very beginning of different contacts that are happening and we are able to not chase them, not get attracted by them, not get repulsed by them, not go chasing after them, not go constructing stories after them, not go pursuing likes and dislikes after them. We are just able to see them begin and we are able to quiet them there and then itself without uh, having to actually wander away from the object of meditation and use the six hours to come back. We are able to relax them there itself. And equanimity helps us here because it uh, reduces our tendency to either get repulsed or attracted to something. You may have a thought that is interesting. You will be likely to chase after it. You may have, you may simply have some thought uh, that has nothing to do with anything. And you may simply feel a sense of revulsion of why did this thought come up when I'm trying to meditate. So equanimity prevents you from going into those kind of cycles. It just recognizes things are happening. It notes that things are happening, but it uh, reduces the tendency to go after them. And that brings us to the dimension of nothing. So we understand that these things do not have very deep qualities. The th phenomena that are happening, they're not, they don't have very deep qualities other than the meaning that we ascribe to them. So those kind of insights start coming to us. So this is the end of the sutta. And like a lot of the other suttas, we don't have a sentence that says the bhikkhus were satisfied with the uh, Buddha's discourse. So it ends a little abruptly, uh, not in line with other uh, a lot of the other suttas. Uh, the reason I wanted to share this today is uh, uh, one, to understand the importance of uh, the Brahma Viharas and secondly, to also understand that uh, these are not uh, just touchy feely goody thoughts, but uh, these are actually very specific skills uh, to be developed, to be inculcated in the right way so that they can take us to higher levels of understanding. And uh, the Buddha clearly correlates them with the jhanas his preferred mode of helping people lead, reach to mental liberation, mental development. So if anyone ever has any doubts or uh, this, I think uh, I'm hopeful this sutta will help with the hindrance of doubt because a lot of people feel a little uncomfortable about the Brahma Viharas. Everybody else that I know is practicing breath or uh, I'm not very sure I'm getting the Brahma Vihara right. So these are all related to the hindrance of doubts. We, uh, it's very valuable to develop these. They are the antidotes to a lot of unwholesome things in our life. And when properly developed, they can take us to places of great and very deep insight. So let's uh, respect the Brahma Viharas. Let's develop them. Let's make them a part of our life. So yeah, that's what I had to say on the, share on the Dhamma Viharas. Happy to take any questions. Questions are an important part uh, of this uh, kind of practice. So we would encourage questions. Anybody? It can be a questions uh, uh, not related to this topic also. Anything related to meditation or uh, anything uh, you want to clarify. Uh, also, you may ask questions.
Sara has a question. <laughs> Hello, and thank you so much. It was a wonderful talk. I'm trying to think of a question. <laughs> but one, maybe on the way to a question, is to ask if you could say, share something a little more around what you were talking about, uh, the value of equanimity and choices that we um, are in front of us, that we need to be skillful around not taking from a place of aversion and how to go through the, the, the balancing of finding the skillful way. Obviously, we have the, the tension that gives us the insight that we're we're actually feeling very um, charged by a situation. Um, but sometimes I think things are, this, this is an area where it, it, it can require a lot of um, balancing when, when things are, and it, it links also to what you were saying about doubt and sometimes uh, the way isn't completely clear around, around decision-making. So I think there's some, some confusion we can end up in, how to balance, how to release away from the aversion, then there's some doubt, and we're looking for skillful, wholesome ways forward. Uh, great question, uh, Sarah. So uh, I'll mention a couple of things uh, before getting to the question. So one of the thing reasons why uh, the Brahma Viharas are so effective also, right? So the Buddha just talks in this sutta, at least, he just talks about the how they correlate with different uh, dhanas and the other sutta he talks about how they can be antidotes. So one thing is when you look at the Brahma Viharas, when you develop them. So by nature, uh, what does, what, where does craving come from? Craving comes from a survival instinct, right? So every organism that is alive today, they are they know how to do three things. They know how to reproduce, they know how to avoid harm. So whether it is death or whether it is being named and they know how to get enough uh, energy so, so that they can expend it. Right. So you get as much food, a little more food than you end up spending uh, unless you're like me and I need to spend a little more energy than I'm eating. But uh, uh, so those are the three things uh, that creatures can do. And that is why to be able to do these three things and harm avoidance is especially important. That is what uh, makes us focus a lot on negative information that comes in our lives. So because we are, uh, you know, we have that instinct of saying that, is this going to harm me? Is this going to cripple me, which makes me unable to either uh, reproduce or to get uh, enough energy, you know, manage my energy budget? Or is it something that's going to affect my survival directly? So we do tend to fixate a lot on those and craving essentially reduces any information that is coming. It uh, uh, kind of tries to reduce it into a emotion of I like it, I don't like it or a feeling. I mean, feeling emotion, these words are a little, uh, the English words are like a little, not, they're not exact translations of the you know underlying uh, mechanisms that are happening uh, because everybody also has different interpretations of these but the like it don't like it kind of uh, thing comes from that survival instinct you know so i can't think about uh, you know stepping on a thorn in the forest and i can't think about what will be the implications of it on my food gathering two days from now i can't think about it objectively and logically i need to immediately spring into action i need to take weight off my foot right so that's where the craving immediately puts you into action but the thing is thanks to cooperation thanks to developments that have happened today we don't live in a world where we are facing at least most of us are fortunate enough not to be in a situation where we are facing existential danger at all points of time so when we start developing these right? so if you look at all the uh, Brahma Viharas, none of them are directed towards us, right? So the first two, loving kindness and compassion are directed towards others. Joy is something that is directed towards everyone, you know, appreciative joy. It is not like limited to a specific person, for instance. And equanimity is telling us, uh, you know, equanimity is again something more of a state of mind than something that is directed towards 
other people it is directed towards events it, it is directed towards the state of our mind so when we develop these we are not in neither of these loving kindness compassion joy equanimity we are not thinking about our myopic gain and interest at that point of time i want certain outcomes i don't want certain outcomes we are not stuck in that thought process right so naturally these reduce the craving the amount of craving when we are spending time doing this actively doing this this is the center of our field of attention so the craving goes down now not only is this good in terms of uh, creating a healthy state of mind the other thing that it helps is it sharpens our mindfulness so when we move from a situation like that to a situation of craving okay you are sitting and sending loving kindness or compassion and suddenly uh, you think about something somebody said at work that you didn't like right so when that craving comes in like why would that person say so or what would i have said to them when that craving sets in there is a big contrast in the state of your mind from being completely directed towards the benefit of others to suddenly coming towards why i don't like it and there may not even be any benefit it is just simply that you are unable to distance yourself from that feeling of dislike right you're caught in that thought so when we develop these feelings when we keep them going for larger longer times in our life we start developing a sensitivity towards when we are going really down the rabbit hole when we are really getting into craving in a situation so we are creating a contrast between our baseline state of mind and between state uh, states of mind that are extremely personalized extremely emotional extremely agitated and unwholesome right so that is how we are uh, so as you do it right skill in different situations is a uh, is something it's a lifelong endeavor that you you can always do better you can always be more compassionate you can always be more skillful in what you do so again uh, in another discourse to rahula so i think the broad uh, things that the buddha says is will this action create suffering for me will it create suffering for others i mean those are the basic things that you need to think about the other thing is uh, if you look at the kakachupam sutra that's also related to the simile of the saw that is also related to the brahma viharas and there the buddha says no matter what another person says whether their speech is true or false meant for your benefit not meant for your benefit whether it is timely untimely you have to maintain a mind of loving kindness towards them so what we do is then we are taking agency away from external situations external actors that how we feel how we think how our state of mind is purely in reaction to whatever is coming we take that agency that no matter what other people are doing i am going to act out of a certain place of compassion of loving kindness of equanimity of joy so that my state of mind remains good now and the actions that i take will create good outcomes for me in the future as well as for other people so that's the important thing i think compassion is when it comes to other people when it comes to uh, situation especially involving people right so i think compassion is uh, extremely crucial so the buddha also used to spend a lot of time sending compassion uh, because he used to teach he used to uh, guide people and compassion is very important so the different brahma viharas become critical for different things. if you are caught up in aversion for like the hindrance of doubt there may be nobody else involved right so compassion for other people may not be that helpful but equanimity uh if you have you know a version for how you are doing things or you know uh related to that then equanimity can help even joy can help it it uh, changes the state of mind these are things that you'll need to practice first practice them in your meditation then in different situations in life as you become more familiar with those feelings infuse those feelings when you're responding to different situations in life see how your behavior is different from what your behavior in the past has been and if you think you have done better then those are the behaviors that you want to teach your mind because we are constantly coaching and training our mind on what is the right thing to do right the mind just cares i mean the mind is at the base of it it is wired to do those three things right so any action that you take 
and you are still fit to reproduce you are still fit to conserve energy you are still fit to avoid harm so the mind says okay this is a solved problem let me use the same solution that i used the last time let me take the same action that i did last time that's how habits form and now you have to see what was your state of mind when you brought in a new habit when you acted on the foundation of one of the brahma viharas was the outcome more satisfying was the outcome more wholesome and if so then how do i start training my mind to move towards those sort of actions in the same situation so it's a continuous act of uh, training your mind to interpret situations differently and act in a way that is wholesome and supportive of your mental development now and in the future thank you very much it's very uh, comprehensive explanation and and also very motivating about how how we need to work with this baseline state of mind because without without that we we haven't anywhere skillful to come back to for the daily life decisions so it's really helpful thank you there is a, a mention um, uh, means a question in the uh, chat why get negative thoughts during uh, meditation why do we get ne negative thoughts during meditation how can how can i control my negative thoughts whatever thoughts you get during your meditation it's a any any distraction anything that happens right it is a combination of your external and internal environment so when you talk about thoughts they are more a reflection of your internal environment it may be triggered by something external right and what is happening is like i mentioned so we have had a lot of impressions in our mind we have thought we have taught a lot of habits to our mind so our mind is a predicting engine it is always trying to look at so if you have done maths or physics right so the problem may say that an astronaut is jumping on the moon now you don't know what an astronaut we have never been to the moon you've never met an astronaut maybe you have but i haven't uh, so i'll answer for my well say this for myself uh, what my mind will do is my mind will say that hey this is a problem related to projectile movement it is the same as throwing a ball on earth right and i know how to solve it so i reduce that situation into something i know something i've solved something is familiar and i use the same solution that i used last time there is no reason for me to use a different solution so what's happened is you have certain impressions certain ways that you have responded in the past to different actions create negative thoughts and again negative thoughts is a very broad and uh, uh, broad kind of term but it can be say you know dissatisfaction with your work or it can be dissatisfaction with a person it can be dissatisfaction with other things right so those kind of thoughts will come up because in the past you have personalized them you have been attached with them with craving so your mind thinks this is something important so it is as important as uh, so your mind your attention is has to decide what are the things in its environment that it wants to engage with and it engages with those things that you have taught your mind is important right so for example you come into a room right for me my first thing will be to see what are the gadgets in those rooms and for somebody else it may be you know what is the level of cleanliness in that room or it might be what is the kind of lighting that is in the room so they have taught themselves that these are the important thing right so they have people have different tendencies so when you spend a lot of time repetitive cycles of thinking with a particular negative thought why did this person behave like this with me yesterday so your mind naturally learns that one that it is important to you it is personalized you are deeply identified with that thought and the second is the more unresolved it is that you don't know what to do with it you don't have a clear solution out of resolving that thing for yourself the more likely it is to come and pop up in your mind what can you do you cannot control things coming up so things are coming up because the environment is conducive for it that's it if the en environment is conducive to for you to think about food 
you will think about food if the if you have just talked about some kind of sport before doing your sitting the environment may be conducive for you to have a thought about that sport right so those things are coming up because the environment is conducive for it what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to start improving the environment you don't want to control your negative thoughts we thoughts are not our enemies they are our teachers they are teaching us where our attachment is where our personalization is where our identification is so when you have a thought of say a certain person behaving in a certain way you realize that i am very deeply attached with it and what you do is first you start reducing that personalization you start stop thinking about it as i like it i don't like it don't get trapped by your liking or disliking of that event instead relax into it just understand that it is something that has happened understand that you are not thinking about it your attention is distracted by a certain thought so when we recognize we also depersonalize right we don't think that i am now thinking about that or i have stopped thinking about my object of meditation again instead you can see it as my attention or attention is now on this thought so it is just a thought the meaning is added by you now when you bring for example since today we talked about the brahma viharas when you bring start bringing the brahma viharas into the situation uh, into your next interaction with that person for instance that you see compassion you see that they are acting from a point of suffering your actions may be different your mind's interpretation may be different and as you start changing those your habits will change at the same time in your meditation every time your mind gets attached with that negative thought what you do is you use the six hours you say it is just a thought that my attention is caught up with you don't run after it you don't get repulsed by it you relax the craving that is underlying it you smile and you come back so every time you relax you reduce the craving it starts becoming less important less personalized to you it, you stop identifying with it you stop saying that my happiness and my suffering is solely dictated by the outcomes or the events that are surrounding this particular thought right so you gain more control over your ability to look at a situation and to act more objectively rather than as a slave to your likes and dislikes so just allow those to come treat them as a teacher you can even be happy that that thought has come because it has taught you that is where your attachment lies as you use the six hours as you use wise effort you reduce the craving you reduce that uh, attachment that you have to that thought that is the basis for all your suffering and you teach your mind a new habit that when this thing comes up i don't need to get all agitated about it i can simply do what is the action required in that particular context so can i ask something yes yeah it's wonderful lecture it's my personal question uh, i'm just a beginner but when i uh, give first we have to give metta to ourselves and then to others but while giving metta to others now sometimes i feel that uh, these people i'm having uh, i'm not having good experience or bad experience so can't give metta but i have to give metta since it is written in that format so i think or uh, how can i be uh, like a hypocrite if i'm not having uh, that good experience with that particular person or unable so, to let uh, go uh, so i'll just uh, go through the instructions right so we we are trying to take baby steps right before being saying that i'm able to send loving kindness to the entire world we want to start small just start get your training wheels on start by sending it to ourselves right second thing that you want to do is send to a spiritual friend now how do you select this friend this is somebody that you actually have a very good relation with or very good respect for if you don't have somebody like that you can choose somebody for example that you have a lot of respect for you know, uh, you know when that person uh, when when you think of that person or that person comes up somewhere you naturally have respect for them you wish them well right so choose a person like that where the relationship is not too complicated for that reason when we select a friend we don't select someone that is a family member because with family members there are always some uh, you know it's a very intimate relationship it can be complicated also or there may be just certain things that may distract our mind 
so we take a person who is not a family member we take somebody who does not have say health problems uh, somebody who is alive and well healthy right we choose someone who is alive and healthy and we also choose someone that uh, we don't have any uh, physical attraction towards right so our mind doesn't get diverted so from sending it to ourselves we are now choosing the next easiest subject somebody who satisfies these criteria it's easy for us to feel good for them if it is a friend choose someone who also has similar kind of feeling that they do have respect for you and they you know wish you well as well so th- we'll start with that so start with training we'll start with slowly uh familiarizing yourself with the feeling of loving kindness deepening your understanding deepening the depth of your loving kindness thank you sir and stick to one person okay don't change the person that you're sending loving kindness to thank you sir Okay, I think uh, it's time for uh, today, Bante. Okay, then uh, we will uh, share merits and uh, uh, we can uh, kind of uh, hope that uh, we get uh, more uh, uh, suggestions for topics in the future and uh, we can have more sessions. Uh, in the future, we'll uh, try and call other teachers also, and we can we'll we invite uh, Rajiv also to give the talks over here. So I think it went very well, and uh, Sadhu and Anum Anuga for the Dhamma teaching, and we will uh, share the merits. Uh, please join us, uh, Rajiv. Uh, you also please join us uh, in the sharing of merits. May suffering once be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May all beings share this merit for acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. The background noise is kind of disturbing. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much. One thing I forgot. Uh, this is what the sister Kima always does. So I have got a new this thing. Well, <laughs> okay, everybody. <laughs>